Accounting Equation and Excel. Check form, the form typically used to decrease cash. Get ready and some coffee because we're learning the accounting foundation. The accounting equation with Excel. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty, to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in Excel. If you don't have access to this workbook, that's okay because we basically built this from a blank worksheet, but started in a prior presentation. So if you want to build this entire worksheet from a blank sheet, you may want to begin back there or you could just build your own worksheet as you go or possibly just follow along with good old paper and pencil. If you do have access to this workbook though, there's three tabs down below. The example, practice and blank tabs. Example, in essence, answer key, the practice tab having pre-formatted cells. So you can practice the practice problem with less Excel formatting. The blank tab, the one we will be working in, started with a blank worksheet, but now we're basically using a template to do the data input, adjusting the worksheet as needed as we go. Let's go to the example tab to get an idea of what we will be doing, looking at transactions that are gonna be check form types of transactions. Remembering we need to be very careful about the terminology that we're going to be using, especially as accounting software comes into play with things like bank feeds. Because many times people will say things like, well, we don't need check forms anymore. However, if you look at accounting software that uses things like bank feeds, they still are going to use check forms with the bank feeds as the data input form that is used when you do an electronic uh, type of transaction or record something with the help and the use of the bank feeds. So when we think about a check then, we can obviously think about a handwritten check, a check that we actually write, and then when it is cashed, it's gonna be decreasing our checking account. But we also want to think about the data input form into like a software that will be used to decrease the checking account in a similar way as we thought about the bill form as the data input form that it's going to increase the accounts payable and the pay bill form being a type of check form, but one that is specific that decreases the checking account, but also decreases the accounts payable. So now we're going to think about those normal type of transactions, typically, some of which you can probably do with the bank feeds. And if you're working in a business that basically pays everything with cash, as many small businesses do as they become due, in other words, you're not tracking the accounts payable, then you might be able to set up the bank feeds, automating that system quite nicely using many accounting softwares. But remember that all the decreases to the checking accounts, even if done with bank feeds, are typically going to be assigned a check type form because that's the form used by many accounting softwares to decrease uh, the checking account. Even if they don't call it a check form, that's kind of like the traditional name or some of the big softwares like Intuit, uh, which is QuickBooks, will still call it that. So keeping that in mind, we're going we're gonna to enter some checks pay electric bill. So we paid the electric bill before with a bill form, increase in accounts payable. This time we'll use the good old check form by furniture. So same thing we did with the bill form, but this time we're just going to pay it with uh, the check and then we're going to pay uh, the invent or by inventory. Similar types of transactions we did before with a bill form, but this time using a check form paying for them as we go. The practice tab will have pre-formatted sales. It'll look much like, however, the blank tab because we're basically just working in the template that we had set up 
before. All right, so let's we're going to start with the 50,000 just to have some cash on the books, imagining that the owner put in the 50,000 increasing the cash, meaning the assets, which is an asset of 50,000 and the other side being equity. So there's 50,000 in the business, nothing is owed to third party liabilities. Therefore, if we were to liquidate the company, that 50,000 would be going to us the owners. All right, then we're going to say that on 115 we're going to pay the electric electric bill with cash. So the questions that we ask typically when thinking about the transaction is cash affected? In this case it is. Which way is it going? It's going down. So the first thing I would note is that okay, I can do that right off the bat. Let's put the 500. Let's say it's $500. So I'm going to put negative 500 in cash then the next question is well what's the other side that is impacted uh it's not going to be a liability because that would be like we owe someone money it's going to be in the equity in the income statement part of it as an expense for the electric bill now just a quick note on the timing of the electric bill remembering that you might be uh if you work with small businesses they might be on a cash-based system or on at an accrual uh, based system remembering that if you're working with small businesses you might be trying to build a business around automating everything as much as possible therefore wanting to be on a cash basis method as much as possible therefore using the check form all the time but in the process of of bank feeds to automate uh the transaction so that's one you know strategy that you might put into play uh, and you have to be careful of when an accrual component is going to come into play because the accrual transactions will kind of mess things up because if you have to put it on the books as, as an asset or if you go through accounts payable, it's going to be a more difficult to automate uh, your bank feeds. Now, also just note some types of things like the bill form makes sense when we pay them to expense them more easily than other types of things why because an electric bill is something that we consumed we've already consumed the energy and they're making us pay for it afterwards after it has been consumed therefore it would make sense for us to just write it off as an expense whereas if you pay for something like insurance that becomes a little bit more problematic because you pay for the insurance before the coverage happens so we have, that's what we have to be careful of with this accrual type of thing. All right, so we're going to go to the expense side on the equity over here. So we're in the equity, we're in the income statement. And then it's just a matter of what category we're going to put this thing in. I'm going to put it into uh, the utilities, remembering also that with the expenses, we have the biggest leeway in terms of categories that we want to be putting into play. If you're in the United States, you might be trying to use some categories that line up possibly to taxes to make sure that your your tax uh, income tax will be as easy to do as possible. But even then, there's going to be a leeway. In other words, utilities is the classic example because utilities used to include things like the telephone, electric bill, gas, water, sewage, trash, so on, so forth. Usually fairly small items therefore it making sense to group them all together instead of having all these different line items broken out with small possibly insignificant for decision making purposes dollar amounts within them but if any of these come become large such as the telephone for most companies it's going to be broken out of utilities and reported in its own expense account it will have the same bottom line for total equity but might be a significant line item for decision making purposes so for our case if the electric bill then was quite large if i if i used the electric bill to to grow plants or something like that with lighting then i might want to break out the electric bill on itself because it's very important expense but if it's relatively small i might group it together with the trash and uh the gas and so on so i'm going to put it into utilities also, I'm going to make it a negative. It's going to be a negative because it's going to be decreasing total equity, decreasing net income. So we're going to say that's going to be 500. Boom. So that's going to be decreasing net income, which is revenue or sales minus the expenses. We don't have any revenue. So we have a negative net income at this point. And that then would roll into the balance sheet, decreasing the total balance sheet equity account. 
All right, let's put in zeros across the boards. I'm going to put zero tab, zero, 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 zero. So I have that nice underline in play, zero, zero, zero. Maybe I should just already start with, oh, no, I don't want to zero that, with zeros in there and then just change the one that we want. Maybe I should add zeros all the way in there so I don't have to do that every time. Maybe I'll do that. That's a good idea. That's a good idea, man. All right, let's copy this down and say, all right, now cash, uh, is the, the 500, negative 500, copy this down. Nothing happened to the accounts payable, copy this down. That puts us back in balance. That's good because assets went down 500, equity went down 500, makes perfect sense. Let's put our balance over here, balance. Now I'm gonna sum these two up, which will subtract them out because the second one is a negative sum. The trustee sum function, our favorite function, it's the best man sum function. I'm gonna paste it just the formulae and then I'll paste the formula here. Paste just the formula, just the formula and then paste it here. Boom. All right, so now on the equity, you can see we have a negative. If I sum these up, that comes out to negative 500. Total equity then on the balance sheet would be reported just as one number of 49,050. Uh, uh, 49, and then on the income statement, it would break out that period of activity, that month or year, which is only includes a negative 500 at this point in time. So that's how the income statement and balance sheet kind of work together, remembering that the accounting equation represents the balance sheet as of a point in time, income statement giving us that timing, breaking out the equity component. Let's copy this down, copy down, 49, uh, uh, 500, copy down the liabilities, no change there, and then boom. So let's put some underlines on these, underlines, there we have it. So, so now uh, I would say we have cash of 49,500. If we liquidated the business, I'm not gonna get back this 500. It's been consumed. We paid the utility company for, uh, expenses and hoping it helps us to generate revenue it hasn't generated revenue yet but there but there it is so therefore if i liquidated now the forty nine thousand would is all we'd have that would come to us as the owner all right let's do another one and say now we're going to say on uh 120 let's say we buy furniture for cash so this time just like we did with the accounts payable, we're buying furniture, but we're paying for it at the point. Before I get into this, one more thing I just want to show here where it says pay electric bill with cash. You might have gotten, you might have said, hey, look, if, if it's a bill form, then I should be paying a lot. It should be a liabilities going up. Remember, the terminology gets a little messy there. And if you're using a textbook, you have to be very careful on how the textbook is saying the terms because in practice, it would be obvious that you're paying a bill. In a textbook, they have to be careful and say, what, what is happening here? Are you, are you paying, is it a bill that you're paying for on account, meaning accounts payable, or did you pay for it with cash? Now, if I say that there's a bill that we're paying the electric bill with cash, what I'm trying to indicate here is that we've got the electric bill and instead of entering it into the system as a bill, which that terminology means that we would increase the liability account, no, we're, we're just paying it with cash. So now we have a difference between the terminology for a bill in normal language, we got billed, they invoiced us, they billed us, versus the data input language, which is I'm not gonna enter a bill because I'm entering it I'm just paying it with cash. Therefore, I'm gonna enter a check form. And that also becomes problematic terminology rise because I'm not actually writing a check. I'm doing a check data input, which might be done simply with a bank fee transaction. So that's something just to, again, the terminology, it's accounting's getting easier, but the terminology is getting actually somewhat more complex to be able to communicate with people exactly what is happening and what you need to be doing and what the software is going to basically do for you everything is the accounting system is basically the same but 
how things are being entered uh, could be automated or, or not. And you have these electronic transfers that kind of confuse things a little bit, but the data input form are still named similarly. Now, if I buy furniture for cash, so now we go to Office Depot, we buy furniture. Is cash affected? We're going to say, yes, cash is affected, and therefore we're going to decrease the cash. Now, again, we might have got, you can, you can imagine going to Office Depot and actually paying for it, possibly not writing a check, possibly still doing some kind of electric transfer while you're in Office Depot, however, however you're paying for it, possibly, but, uh, but you can imagine the receipt being kind of like a bill form. They, they billed you for it and you paid for it at the store, but you paid for it with cash. So you're not going to enter a bill. You're not going to enter the receipt as a bill. Of course, you're going to enter it as a check, which might be done with an electronic transfer, which might be done automatically as it clears the bank, but still the system will record it as a check type of transaction because that's the transaction that decreases the checking account typically. So I'm going to say that, that how much did we buy this for? That we'll say 1000 this time, furniture. So cash is going to go down by 1000 Now, where does the other side go? And you might say, well, it should do the same thing that we did up here, meaning it's going to be an expense. Furniture expense makes sense, but furniture is typically something fairly large. So you might assign a dollar amount, although a dollar amount is not typically how we define these things, but in practice, you might have a dollar amount, right? Because if it goes over a certain dollar amount, it's likely that you would have to put it on the books as an asset, remembering the same kind of concept conceptually of buying like a thousand dollar office building. If you bought a thousand dollar office building, expensing it would look funny because you wouldn't be able to compare the income statement of this month or year to last month or last year because you've got this giant expense in the current year which isn't going to happen in any other year because the expense wasn't actually consumed in that year, but was just paid for in that year. That's what the accrual system is trying to do. Therefore, even if you're on a cash based system, you're going to have to do some accrual things when the difference of when you actually earned the money on the revenue side or when you consumed the, the goods or services on the expense side differs greatly from when you paid for it, such as when you bought a building or in this case, when you buy furniture. And remember in the United States, the tax code is also gonna kind of force you to put things on the books as an asset. Again, even if you're on a cash-based system. Remembering also that the furniture and equipment, other types of property, plants and equipment are possible, are gonna be less transactions. You don't do those every day. So it should be easier to manage those when they do come up. You wanna track them, make sure you're recording them, get them to your tax professional in the proper detailed fashion so they can do what they need to do with it. All right, so it has to go on the books as an asset then. So the other side then is not gonna be an expense. It's on the same side of the accounting equation. It's an asset, not a current asset, but a fixed asset. So it's gonna be fixed asset, meaning we're not gonna consume it within like a year. Uh, we're gonna consume it over a longer period of time. And we'll have to deal with depreciation, which means we'll have to do adjusting entries, which we'll talk possibly about later. Let's put zeros across the board. Zero, 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 zero. Okay, let's put our totals in, summing up, not up to the top, just the last balance plus the current equals the sum of those two. Boom. Copy that. Copy that. Roger out. Roger out. Pasting it. Formulas only. Pasting it. Formulas only pasting it formulas only notice that we don't have to deal with any sub ledgers or anything over here why because we're on a cash based system for the most part again even though i had to put it on the books uh as an asset and also remember that if you're on a cash based system you can't just choose sometimes to be in a cash based system it, it's like the industry that you're in so if i'm in an industry where i have to track accounts payable more closely then that's just what I have to do. If I'm in an industry where I have to invoice the client and then collect on it later, I'm going to be doing an accrual uh, type of thing. But if you're in the type of business where you can just pay the expenses, which are many small businesses can as they become due, you don't have to deal with accounts payable, subledger eliminated, bookkeeping process easier. That 
is something you want to think about when when you're trying to pick up clients. What kind of clients are you looking to pick up? What kind of clients are you looking not to pick up because they're not in your wheelhouse? And then the balance, we're going to say, uh, let's copy this down. I'll copy this down to, to here first. So nothing happened. How can that be? Now, this is a, what's a little bit confusing about the accounting equation because notice these two sides were on the same side of the accounting equation. So that means there's no impact on the assets, although one asset went down and the other asset went up. So, so what happens if I liquidated the company? Let's copy this down again. Let's copy this down. My balances are back in balance. Duh, duh, duh. Let's put an underline here. So now what if I liquidated uh, the company? Well, if I liquidated the company, now I've got this 1,000. See, see this, this amount has been consumed. It's gone to help generate revenue. So it is, it's gone. And then the furniture, we still kind of have it because I got this nice furniture right now. I got a, I got a, I got a, a desk maybe <laughs> and some chairs around it. Our, our conference desk, beautiful thousand dollar conference desk or something. And I still have it. And if I liquidated the company, I, I would have to sell the desk in order to get the thousand dollars back, which possibly will most likely not be worth a thousand dollars, which means we're going to have to depreciate it soon to write it off as it's being consumed. But in theory, if I could get the thousand dollars back by selling it, then I would have the cash that I could that I could then uh, give to myself. So so I don't have forty nine thousand five hundred uh, in cash, although that's the equity value of the business. We've got forty nine thousand. 500 of assets, but some of them are sunk in furniture and equipment. I want to point that up kind of as we go, because uh, a lot of times when people look at the value of a business, they say, well, look at the net equity is this, but most of it's not going to be in cash for most businesses because the business isn't there to hold on to cash. It's there to hold on the assets that are going to be used in order to generate revenue. And if they were holding on to cash and it wasn't going to be intended to use to generate revenue, why are they holding on to it? They should give it back to the owner where the owner can then invest in something else like stocks and bonds at the very least. All right. So let's go to the next one. We're going to say on 125, let's say we buy inventory, inventory for cash. Let's say... Uh, well, actually, this furniture, I had at 5,000. I'm going to change this to 5,000. Notice the beauty of this. Everything, I didn't hard code anything. So if I change that to 5,000, everything should update automatically. Boom. Across the board. And so that makes sense. That's why I'm using formulas to, to do this. So if you've been hard coding and you tried to change that, it's going to mess you up. And you're going to be like, why did you do that? Uh, why did you do that to me? You, you should have fixed it and went back and edited the video, but no, because this is going to teach you a lesson. This is going to teach you a lesson. You have to connect everything and not do, you can't just, because then you can just change it. You want everything to be connected with formulas, not hard coding. Okay. Anyway, I didn't do that on purpose, so I'm sorry if that bothered people. Let's go to the next one. Buy inventory. So now we're going to buy inventory, remembering that inventory becomes kind of an issue in and of itself because we have to track inventory, but we bought it for cash this time instead of on account. That should make it a little bit easier because we're not going to track the accounts payable. Is cash affected? Yes, it is because we bought it with cash. Therefore, we can still think about using it possibly with the bank fee transactions if you have inventory, but inventory is going to mess up your bank fee transactions because you might have to track the inventory meaning you're going to have to use some kind of flow assumption. And that means you're going to have to use a form that tracks inventory. And so you have to be careful of that. You might be able to still use bank feeds, but you got to be careful that the form that you're using is going to track the inventory and whatever method you're going to use. But in just general uh, terms, we're going to say, well, we bought it for cash. So cash is going to go down by 1000. The other side uh, where should the other side go? Well, you might think equity again, like with the utility bill, because why did we buy the inventory? In order to generate revenue, we're going to sell the inventory. So maybe we should expense it. What's the expense form related to inventory? Cost of goods sold. But normally I wouldn't put it into cost of goods sold yet because I didn't sell it. 
right? I'm holding on to the inventory. I'm going to sell it later. Now, in some cases, if you bought the inventory specifically to sell it and, and it's like a custom situation, the easy thing to do, as always, would be on a cash-based system and just expense it as, in, as, in, as cost of goods sold. But normally you can't do that because you're holding on to the inventory and you want to track it as an asset. You want to track it on the books. You want to make sure that you're you're keeping an eye on your inventory so you don't have people stealing uh, your inventory. Dang, pirates. I'm telling you, stealing your inventory messes you, messes you all up, man. But anyways, so, so that means you have to put it on the books as an asset. So we're going to put it on the books as an asset. Uh, so inventory is going to be here. Ba-boom. And then, okay. So there we have it. So then if I copy my formulas down, we're going to say that the assets... No change once again, just like up above. Why? Because one asset went down, cash, and then an, another asset went up, inventory. Why did we do that uh, if it didn't have any change to assets? Wouldn't I rather have the cash? Well, it's because I hope to sell the inventory for more than I paid for it. <laughs> and then our assets then our assets will go up, right? But that, that hasn't happened yet. So then let's go over here and then uh, put zero, zero, tab zero zeros across the rest of them and tab tab zero tab zero tab zero tab zero tab let's copy the balances down so we're going to sum up just the last two equals the sum of just the last two boom i'm going to copy that Control c paste it special just the formulae so it doesn't mess up the beautiful color coding and there we have it all right pasting across this way and then okay and so then if i go back to the start we can say the balance is now if i copy this down we're now at still these two are 49.5 no change here no change to the liabilities we're not dealing with liabilities man we're making it easy paying things as they come due liabilities no n no not using them underline all right so now we've got uh 49,500 in equity in assets and 49,500 in equity meaning all of the assets belong to us that's the net value of the business but if i was to liquidate remember that i can't just i can't just get 49,500 cash because now $1,000 of it is in fixed assets. I'd have to sell the fixed assets, hopefully for $1,000. And I'd have to sell, I'm sorry, the inventory for $1,000. And I'd have to sell the fixed assets for $5,000 to get the $6,000 into cash. So that hopefully then I can get, if I liquidated the $49,500 in cash. Now, obviously the problem is, if there's a problem in the business, it's probably because I can't sell the inventory which means it's going to be worth less than $1,000. And I can't possibly sell the, the, the equipment for the same value I purchased it for, although we will account for that to some degree when we do depreciation, lowering the value on the books for fixed assets as time passes. So we'll talk about that more later. But that's just an idea or a reason or some information about why the equity is only book equity doesn't necessarily mean that you can get that money in cash if you close the business. And uh, so just to keep that in mind, because that's a common kind of misconception, especially if you had a large business, if you start selling off all the assets of the business, you, it's going to lower the value of the of the assets as you go, possibly. So any case, so then we're going to, I also want to go into the inventory over here. And let's just imagine we had a sub ledger that we had to track for inventory, remembering that normally you'd have to put it on the books as and use a flow assumption like first in, first out, last in, first out, weighted average. Different accounting software can help with those kind of tracking, but you have to be very careful in determining how exactly you want to deal with tracking inventory. You might have a very simple method that you track inventory outside of the accounting software and then you use some other software or Excel to track your inventory. You might track it within the accounting software like a QuickBooks or something like that. Or you might have more complex tracking inventory needs where you need something more complex. That's one of the reasons you might have to level up 
from something uh, like a QuickBooks. So again, inventory is an area where you can specialize. And when you specialize, you, you're usually going to do it kind of by industry because then you're going to get good at a particular type of inven inventory uh, need. All right. In any case, we'll just do a quick uh, sub ledger here just to get an idea of it. So let's say we spent $1,000 for inventory. Let's imagine they cost $10 per unit. So that means that the unit cost is going to be 1000 divided by 10. So $100, uh, I, the, the, uh, the change in the unit, $100. So the total, uh, the total units we're going to say is the prior amount, which is zero right now, plus the 100. And that means the total dollar amount, if they all cost 10 units, and we now have 100 of them, would be this amount. Now, remember, this is a basic worksheet. We might have to adjust it later when we start to, to do the full practice problem in accordance with other, whatever flow assumption we use, first in, first out, last in, first out, or weighted average, because the cost of the units of inventory will uh, possibly change over time. So when I sell the inventory, the question is, what's the cost that I should be applying to that inventory? Am I using specific identification? Do I know the inventory thing that I sold specifically and how much it costs? Like if I sold cars or more, if it's other types of inventory, I won't. So I have to use a flow kind of a assumption. And also just realize that if you only sell one thing, it's a little bit easier possibly to track the inventory. If you sell a whole bunch of different things, then tracking inventory in accounting software is going to be a more of a complex task because you have all these different kind of inventory items that you need to be tracking. So, and those are just things to be keeping in mind with inventory. But the general idea is that you should have some kind of sub ledger that should tie out to the value of inventory, which should then match the inventory in the general ledger in the account of uh, inventory, which we might get into more uh, when we get into our practice problem.